Hey, let's do that. Let's do that chord. I'm a child of love. I'm a child of God. I'm gonna climb a mountain. I'm gonna shout about Thank you, Jesus, that you delight in our joy. You delight in us being childlike, Father. We love you.
And I just pray that everybody who is hurting, suffering, grieving, that even in the days when we're not joyful and happy, God, that you can just fill them with your presence and let them know that it is well. Because I struggle every day, but I can still sing, it is well through it all.
Thank you, Jesus. I just feel that there's like this kindness and patience of God that's just here right now, that even if you don't know how to surrender, even if it's hard, he's still patient with you. He's still waiting. He's still there. He knows how to help you. We thank you, Jesus, just for your love. We thank you that you don't give up on us. You walk with us. Anyone in this room right now who just feels alone, who feels like they don't know how to move forward, he says he is the way. He is the only way. Jesus wants to come close today. He is here. We thank you, Father. We are the next generation, the youth of today, and the leaders of tomorrow. Our faith is strong, our potential is limitless, and if you give us a cause to fight for, we will change the world.
Good morning, Ford Point. How's everybody doing? Oh, shoot. You're probably better than the rocket ship. Yeah, I don't know who said that. Thanks, Don. Yeah. Uh, hopefully, Augustine's not in here. She's going to kill me, wherever she's in. <clears throat> well, uh, beautiful morning this morning. Uh, it's great to be in God's presence together. Um, you know, as we kind of go into this new series, I'm reminded that uh, it, the importance of having people in our lives uh, to pour into us. When I was um, or in my mid-20s, I, I uh, did uh, what some of you may have done and um, proposed to a young lady, and she said yes, and we had a wedding date all planned and, and ready to go. And through some you know, circumstances uh, beyond our control, some within our control, but uh, through some circumstances, we decided to move back up to New York, and along the way, we were going to get married in Tennessee, and it wound up not happening, uh, so we still continued the journey north and back here to Syracuse, and didn't really have a, a, a wedding date planned, and wasn't really sure what we were going to do now, uh, so we just kind of took it a day at a time, and then finally, we're just like, you know what, we're going to get married this weekend. No big fanfare, no invitations, no fancy, you know, calligraphy, beautiful, uh, save the date type of things. We just said, you know what, we've uh, postponed this a handful of times already, and uh, you know, it, it, we're just gonna, we're just gonna do this. So some some amazing friends kind of came around my wife and, and put together this theme and this just beautiful event and and stood in as bridesmaids and as best men, and we you know had a, a garden that we got married in. And I remember a day or two beforehand, there was a, a pastor who, you know, I grew up being friends with his son, and we were in, in school together, in, in high school, as well as in Bible school together, and uh, just really good friends of the family, grew up going to his church, and, and he was kind of the, the, the pastor figure that I, I most uh, identified with. And I remember uh, a day or two before this, you know, uh, kind of impromptu wedding took place, he said, hey, Jimmy, why don't we go uh, grab something to eat for lunch? I'm like, sure, you know, I'm, uh, I love a free meal. As long as you're paying for it, I'm down. I'll go wherever you want to go, right? And uh, he decides to take me to Taco Bell. Uh, so obviously he's on a budget, I guess. Um, uh, so we go to Taco Bell. And, you know, I don't know how many people go to Taco Bell to sit down and eat at Taco Bell, but that's what we decided to do. We sat down and, you know, start opening up our, our tacos, our, our crunchy tacos. And he proceeds to have with me the talk. Now, if you're, you know, at a certain age, there's a good chance you haven't gone to health class yet, or there's a good chance maybe your parents haven't sat you down to have the talk, right? Uh, sometimes known as the birds and the bees, and uh, this, this was kind of like the, the graduate course of the talk, right? Uh, the talk that, you know, begins to describe about uh, different things that are going to happen after you say, I do. Uh, if you've been married, there's a good chance you probably have, uh, whether or not you had the talk, you've ex experienced some of those things. And, uh, you know, uh, it's one of those awkward moments where I don't know that I can ever eat inside a Taco Bell again. I go into the restaurant and, you know, start to have chills and I'm just, you got to take this to go or I got to get it delivered because there's no way that I can ever eat inside a Taco Bell, again, after having said conversations, right? And Pastor Lee, he would go on to become, uh, you know, one of our, our greatest advocates as a, as a couple. Uh, whenever we left Florida, there were some kind of, you know, uh, some circumstances that had gone on there with some of the leadership there. And, and he offered to act as a mediator and, and would get on, uh, you know, virtual chats and, and uh, help us to be able to reconcile with some of the leadership down there in Florida, when we decided, you know what, it's time to get back into ministry, and we started pursuing moving to Indiana to, to work at a church there, he was the one who, you know, kind of acted as our biggest advocate, talking to some of the leadership out there and, and really, you know, our biggest cheerleader to, to say, hey, you want these guys. And this was, this was after, you know, early on in my Bible school career, the, the plan was always that I would come back to Faith Chapel, the church that's up on Onondaga Hill, and, and I would act as an intern there and, and kind of spend the rest of my youth ministry days there up on the hill, and you know, I can still remember the, the call when I had been offered this position at the, the church there on campus, Elam Gospel Church. It's kind of this, this big, huge church, and I was offered a position there, and I got on the phone and said, hey, Pastor Lee, you know, I know we had kind of said I was going to come back and, and do this at Faith Chapel, but I had this awesome opportunity, not really, you know, what do you think about it, just 
I'm not going to be able to do what I said I was going to be able to do. Like despite those times when as a, as a young kid acting out of my own best interest, he still decided to, to walk through life with me and with us as a, as a couple. And, and I realized he became, to me, one of the, the biggest advocates for where I am in ministry today. And I'm grateful for the, the fact that he believed in me and he believes in us as, as a couple. So today we're starting this new series called I Believe in You. And I tell you, I struggled a lot because I thought, where do we go from this series, you know, when God doesn't make sense, talking about some of the the biggest moments in our life that just don't make any sense, that we struggle with, that we wrestle with. I mean, throughout the course of this series, just received so much feedback about how much the the series meant to them. And it's one of those things where I'm like, yeah, God, why don't you just take me now because I feel like I'm at the, the pinnacle of... The career here. I don't know where we can go from here that's going to be as meaningful or as impactful. And I just began to feel like there's a, uh, a kind of a culture thing that God wants to do here at Forward Point for who we're going to be as a church that we're going to zone in on for the next couple weeks over the course of May. And it really comes out of one of our core values that we have here at Forward Point. It's this idea that we believe in having relationship over information. It's this idea that comes from John where it says the word, meaning Jesus, became flesh and blood, right? What did Jesus do for us is he, he became flesh and blood. He put on this human costume and came down to earth in here and he moved into the neighborhood. He didn't just shout from heaven that he loved us. He didn't just shout from heaven that he has a plan for us or a, a purpose for us. But he moved into the neighborhood, and we said, you know, we want Ford Point to be a place where we're going to value relationship over information. Because it's real easy to get up here and just spew all sorts of information at you, but if the information doesn't grip your heart the way that it can through relationship, then what we have is is a lot of uh, lemming Christians just kind of go along with whatever information seems right or seems best at the moment. And we began to think, man, what, what would it be like if a community felt like we were for them? If we were in their corner, we said, we believe in you, right? A big reason why we do things like our teacher appreciation times is because we want our schools to know we believe in what you're doing. Why we do the, uh, the food truck rodeos over the summer, we said, you know, we want our community to know that we believe in you. That, you know what, if we had somehow, uh, you know, ran into some kind of hard times and we're not able to, to be forward point anymore here in Eastwood, we would want the community to come and protest in front of the palace to say, we need you in our corner. Because that's what God did for us when he moved into the neighborhood. And what if, what if everyone could feel like they belonged before they believed, right? What if everyone could feel that way where the the community feels like we're for them here? I mean, just just think about the the millions and millions of people who are are here uh, uh, across the globe at this moment, maybe a few hours ago or a few hours still to come, but are gathered together, worshiping Jesus, Rocking out, maybe to an organ, who knows, but millions of people gathered together celebrating and following Jesus because of this event. And it all started where a father believed in his son. If you're not familiar with the, the story, it, it happens in Mark chapter 1 where Jesus is just coming on to the, the scene and, and getting ready to, to enter into his time of ministry. And it says, at that time, in Mark chapter 1, that Jesus came from Nazareth, right? You always heard the expression in Christmas time, Jesus of Nazareth, right? Nazareth is his hometown, so Jesus has been living in his hometown for, you know, some 30 years. And we come on the scene, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was what? And was baptized, right? By John in the Jordan. It's very awesome scene. And then what happens as he's being baptized, just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, here's the scene. All of a sudden, he saw heaven being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove, right? Like that's, just kind of close your eyes for a minute and it's kind of hard to even think about what uh, it must have been like in that time to see where the author would describe it as heaven being torn open and the spirit beginning to descend on a dove as like a dove. 
And then a voice, God says, I'm not done yet. And a voice came from heaven. He says, you are my son. Man, I wonder how many issues and problems and, and, and kids would find themselves not in if they had someone in their life that said, you know, you are my son. And here's God saying to his son, you are my son with whom I love. This public, uh, you know, PDA, this public display of affection, whom I love. And, and with you, I am well pleased. Right? Just imagine some of the, the, the lives that could be changed if at some point along the way they had felt this, you know, no, one, no kid would honestly say that they enjoy public displays of affection for mom or dad, right, in the midst of their friends. <laughs> right, come give me a kiss as they drop you off to school, right? In the moment, no one's, you know, going to like them. But the things that it does to instill confidence to know that despite not acting, liking what, what's happening right now, I believe that you believe in me. And as you read and, and kind of put yourself in the story, you kind of you get the feeling that, that the father here believes in his son. He's saying to Jesus, I believe in you. And heaven tore open. And, and you know, in a few weeks, we're going to be doing baptism here. And I can't guarantee you that the same kind of thing is going to happen, you know, May 30th when we do baptisms here. But there is this awesome experience. And today, where, you know, millions, billions of people since have called themselves and, and died for this thing of following Jesus as a result of a father believing in his son. You know, I relate to this uh, a little bit. Growing up, I, I played basketball, and I, I loved playing basketball. My dad would always take me to play basketball. But there's one thing in my kind of history of life that I'll never forget is playing in games as, as young as I can remember all the way till as old as I can remember. And there was one person in the stands that would scream louder than all the other ones. Right? All I would have to do is kind of step on the floor, and my mom would, would scream louder than any other fan that was there. She would be screaming when no one else was even saying anything. And at the time, right, you kind of, you're embarrassed, and, you know, at first they're like, whose mom is that? But by the end of the season, it's like, Jimmy, you need to talk to your mom, all right? This is getting out of hand. But it left me with this, this feeling of, uh, you know, there's someone who, who believes in me, who's willing to, you know, it doesn't matter what people around are thinking. Like, she is communicating to her son it could just be the two of us in that gymnasium, and that's all you would need. And this is where it all started for Jesus. And as, as you kind of go from here, the, you know, this is the first place that he goes being baptized and receiving this affirmation from his father. But then immediately from here, we're told that Jesus goes into the desert. What would follow this awesome experience would be 40 days of, of fasting and not eating and, and, and just being in the wilderness and then comes these trials, these tribulations, these temptations from the enemy. And the enemy says he has these different things he begins to offer. But always, it, the first two start off with this phrase. He says, if you are the son of God. All right, notice that we have this awesome affirmation where Jesus, God says, Jesus, you are my son whom I love. I am well pleased in you. And then immediately into the desert and the, the enemy begins to try to undercut the affirmation. If, if you are the Son of God, then you could turn these pieces of stone into bread. If, if you were really the Son of God, if God really had this relationship, he really felt this way about you, then he obviously would do these things for you. And we see that the Father's affirmation came after this, this amazing baptism experience Right? And Jesus and God says, this is my son. It wasn't after you know, his son uh, scored a goal in soccer or got an A at the, on a test. Right. Sometimes that's when we begin to, to show our affirmation is, is, is these moments that in the world's eyes are amazing and we can applaud and, and look good on the resume. But here, it's, it's Jesus, of all the things Jesus did, it's, it's being baptized and declaring before everyone there that I'm going to follow God. And that's what moved the heart of God to, to split, to rend open the, the heavens and, and put on the show. He said, I believe in you. So Jesus goes next and, and experiences these 
time of temptation and being in the wilderness. And then immediately from there, he goes and he calls the 12 nobodies, really. I mean, it's the 12 people that the world kind of uh, said, hey, you don't have what it takes to, to continue on in your schooling or uh, to continue on learning about the scripture. You, you just don't have what it takes. So go do, you know, be fishermen and, and be tax people and, and do all these other things. And Jesus goes and he finds these 12 nobodies and he, what does he say to them? He says, I believe in you. Right, come and, and follow me and let's do life together. We're going to, you know, for the next three years, you, we're going to be so close that, you know, you're going to know well, what my breast smells like first thing in the morning. And it's not probably going to be pretty, but we're going to do life together. And, and when he leaves, what does he tell them? He says, I believe in you. You guys, you're going to take this message. You're going to take this gospel, this good news. You're going to take it to the, to the ends of the world. You're going to do greater things than even I. I was able to do. I'm going to give you a helper in the Holy Spirit, and you're going to change the world. I believe in you. I believe in you. And there's this interesting kind of generational dynamic we see in the disciples. Because when I talk about the disciples, there's, there's probably a good chance you think about kind of these, you know, adults that are, you know, has-beens or, or nobodies. But the reality is we, we learned from another story that the disciples were very likely young teenagers under the age of 20. There's this story about Jesus having to pay taxes and, and the, the, the temple leader said, does, you know, does your master, he's talking to Peter, believe in paying, paying the tax? Because anybody 20 years and older has to pay this tax. And, and Jesus says, you know, for the sake of not offending anyone, Peter, go catch a fish. And that fish that you have in his mouth is going to be this four drachma coin. And it's, you know, the temple tax was two drachma for any person over 20. And what Jesus did was he paid taxes for him and Peter. And we kind of infer from there that Jesus was literally the, the first youth pastor. Right? He had this ragtag group of, of young adults somewhere under the age of 20 that he just poured life into. And it kind of starts to make sense why sometimes there was a disconnect between some of the things that Jesus said, and they're like, huh? I don't get it. You ever feel that way? Maybe if you have kids, there's that generational gap, or maybe there's, you know, some adults in your life who, you know, they're not getting the way that you do things. Anybody ever experienced a generation gap like that? I thought to help us kind of experience it, I would tease you a little bit. We're going to do a little generation gap game here. Uh, we're going to see any students here know what shoe this is. Any people 20 years and under know what shoe this is? You're not, you're, are you under 20? Yeah, good try. Right, all right, if you're over 20, what shoe is this? The Reebok what? The pump, right? This is the pump. I had a pair of these. Yeah, the pump. All right, now for, for the older people, what shoe is this? Oh, sh oh, only if you're over, we'll say 30 or over. Do you know? See, you're not over 30. You can try. What shoe is this? Anybody know? You, you're, yeah, you're over 30. Oh, no, I can't tell if you're over 30 or not. That's, I don't know. Yeah. Yes, the Yeezys. Good job. All right, the Yeezys. All right, students, who, who is this? Anybody know? Oh, we have a student who knows? Oh, I know the adults know. This is for the students, the young people. Who is it? Coolio, right? All right, adults, who's this? Anybody know? Joey, what was it? Wow, Joey, you're impressive. You're, you can come hang with my kids now. All right, students, what, what movie is this? Oh, shh, not only the students, the students. This is for to see if the students know. Mrs. Doubtfire, well done. All right, adults, what movie is this? No, not Toy Lane. No clue? Well, Paper Towns. I never heard of it either. I don't know. All right. Students, anybody know who this MTV host is from back in the day? No? Any adults know? Yes, Kurt Loader. All right. How about adults? Anybody know who this MTV? Oh, describe. Yeah, Chanel. All right. Rebecca also can hang with my kids. Good job. All right, students, anybody know which TV show this is? <laughs> you know, and you guys want it to be Harry Potter, but no. Nope. Adults, any adults know? 
Are you afraid of the dark? Remember that growing up? All right, this this one might everybody might get. Which one? Adults? What is this? Yes, Stranger Things. All right, all right. How about this? Who's this guy? Any any students know? Any students know who this is? A weird nerd. You're not wrong. You're not wrong. You're not a student, Dan. Good try. Yes. Steve Urkel from the non-student in the back row there. All right. How about adults? Do you know who this is? You're not an adult. Yes. Wow. Well done. Yes. I have no idea who that is either, but if you play Roblox, right? There's, there's the obvious generational gaps that come into any kind of setting when we're going to do life together. For one, you may be a parent that have kids. There's a, a generation gap. You come into a place like this, and you look over the chairs, and there's ages of all sorts represented here. So Jesus is, is here with his disciples for three years. They're doing life together. And at the end of that, as he's leaving, he says it again, right? I believe in you. You guys are going to do awesome things. And here we are, some 2,000 years later, billions trusting in, in his salvation. And it all started when a father very publicly believed in his son. And this this, this morning, church, is the power of investment, right? I'm not talking about uh, having a youth group, okay? This is not a talk about, hey, we need to raise money because we want to hire a youth pastor and have uh, a youth group that's just going to pay attention to the young people. This is not mentoring, right? This is not uh, you have to sign up to, to take someone who's younger than you under your wing and just kind of transfer information to that person. We're, we're not talking about mentoring here as being part of our culture, right? What we're talking about is investing it's relationship. It's relationship over information. And Paul sums it up in one verse. If there's one verse that kind of uh, sums up the entire series, Paul says to a young Timothy who he's doing life with, he says this. He says, as he's in prison, kind of writing letters to, to, to finalize his life, and he knows what's kind of coming, he says this to Timothy. He says, Timothy, I want you to follow my example. Right? I'm someone who's just kind of a little bit ahead of you, not just in life, but really in my relationship with Jesus. Just a little bit ahead of you in the things that I've seen and in the things that God has done in my life. I'm just a little bit ahead of you. So what I want you to do is to follow my example as I'm following the example of Christ. You see, Timothy, I'm following and looking at Christ and what, what he wants to do in my life. And as I'm allowing him to do that inside of me, I want you to then to look at me and to follow me and to follow my example. So why is this so important, right? I, I would not be here today up on this stage without people outside of my family investing in me, saying, Jimmy, you know what? I believe in you. As a young teenager, there was a man named Mark Fideli who, who took me under his wing through some very rebellious years of my life. And I remember one time he, he took me to, to do sound and lights for a concert because he was a sound and light engineer. And we did the lights for this concert for this small little band that you may have heard of. It was their first tour called, the uh, band was Third Day. Anybody ever heard of that? Yes. It was their first tour along the East Coast, and, and they came into one of the churches here in Syracuse, and we got to do the sound and lights for, for their concert. And he would talk smack about, you know, thinking he was better than me than, than at basketball and and I, you know, of course, gave him knee problems as I crossed him over a few times. But during some times when I was not making wide choices, he came in and, and, you know, he said some hard truths to me. And I would love to tell you that I was a smart kid and listened and, and turned in the direction of my ways. But I remember in the hate of it, I just told him off. And it wasn't until years later that I came back to him and I said, Mark, I just want to thank you. I want to thank you for those, those words of truth that you spoke into my life. I know I didn't receive them then, and I didn't treat you very well, but I am so grateful for you doing that in my life. When I was in Bible school, there was another Mark, Mark Scorzone. He was the, the, the youth pastor who hired me and brought me into his life, and, and he just asked. We never had any kind of conversation that was off limits. He said, Jimmy, you are always welcome in my house, him and his wife. We had this awesome relationship. There's only one rule. He said, Jimmy, if you ever come to the house, okay, and there's underwear on the door handle, don't knock, okay? Just go back home, 
this, now's not the time. But any other time, I could come, and he would pour into me, and he helped me find this position down in Florida, and again, advocated for me. And I already mentioned and talked about Pastor Ray, these people who just believed in me, and who I was able to, to follow them as they themselves were following Jesus. These were guys who, who allowed me to, to stand on their shoulders so I could, I could see and I could learn and I could grow and, and do things that I probably never would have been able to do otherwise. And probably a big reason why I was drawn to be in youth ministry for so long, right? Because I wanted to be for, for other young people the, the same thing that these men were for me in my life. And I loved playing video games, so it kind of made sense to be in youth ministry. But just even a even year ago, I, I think about where, where I was, and I was still very involved in, in youth ministry. We had uh, a youth ministry here at Ford Point, and they would meet at my house. In the midst of that and, and doing Forward Point, then I got involved with Young Life, which is a city meeting for young people. And I had another night of the week where just young people from the city were coming into our house. And again, just very much believing that pouring into young people and to other generations is important. And then COVID hit. And all of a sudden, we had to meet virtually. And then summer break came and we stopped meeting all together. And we began to kind of go through this change as, as Ford Point began to open its doors again. And, and we began to, to grow really at this kind of, uh, with this vision that we, God's calling us to be this unstoppable force here in Syracuse. I, I began to see a need to start investing in some other leaders that are going to be leaders here in the church. And this youth ministry has, has kind of had to go to the wayside. But I believe that someday we will here at Forward Point have a youth ministry. But it's going to begin first by having a, a, an investing culture that we're going to have. Right? Where no matter what your age is, you're going to be able to come here and you're going to be in relationship with other people. And to be able to say, you know, hey, why don't you follow me as I follow Christ? I want to invest in you. And for some of us, this comes naturally. But just because it may or may not come naturally for you, it, it doesn't mean that you get to do it or not do it. This is something I believe that we're all called to do, is to invest in people outside of our generation. It's not just older people to younger people. It can also be older people to even older people. Because the reality is we are just scratching the surface of, of how this pandemic has affected us. We're, we're becoming more and more aware of, of kind of these additional side effects of COVID. And, you know, you go up to, to some of the, uh, the suicide watch floors at the Galasano Children's Hospital and they're full. Hospitals are, uh, have no more room for teenagers to, to come in. And you think about the, the old adults in nursing homes who haven't been able to see family members for a year, and the, the mental weight and burden that is having on us, we're not even yet beginning to realize. Because what we've done is we've turned every other human being outside of our family into these kind of walking health threat. And what the enemy has done, I believe, is to divide us. And there's no investing going on right now. So here we are a year into things, and, and we're not quite out of the woods yet and and you look around and we're beginning to see my wife tells me about all these kids who you know just mental issues and dealing with things that you should never have to do with as a middle school teacher these, what these kids are doing academically there there are kids who who are years behind where they should be in their reading level and their math levels because they weren't able to adapt to this virtual learning and there's no one at home to to help them and it's not just the kids, it's the, look at the adults, right? There's a good chance you've probably, over the last year, have probably gained weight, all right? Let's just be honest. There's not much to do during a, a pandemic than sit on the couch and binge watch some kind of show or series of shows. And it's having a toll on our health. There are people who are becoming adults, becoming hooked on, on unemployment pay and, and stimulus money. And now living lives not honoring the way that God has called us to live. And God's called us to say, we want to invest. We need to, to tell people, you know, follow me. To be real enough to say, follow me as I follow Christ. 
And as long as I can remember, you know what, I've loved war movies based on true stories, and I've always wanted to be the, the guy, the hero who's kind of running through in these different movie scenes. But I wonder, when I'm watching Civil War movies, I'm like, I don't know if I could be the dude who's stupid enough to just march and kind of wait in line until you get shot, right? Or you're in the World War movies, and you're just running, and there's just explosions all around you. I, I don't know that I could be that guy. I would love to be that guy, but I don't know if I can but I feel like, church, we're in the midst of what is our silver war or our world war, but it's not as obvious. And there's an opportunity. I would say there's a need for us to invest, to begin to say, I believe in you, Eastwood. I believe in you, Syracuse. I believe in you, young person on the other side of the room. I believe in you, older person who's still watching online because you're scared to come in. I believe in you. And I believe this is our lifetime's war. To fight with isolation and to fight the abandonment. And, and I'll be honest, I feel like we've been playing it safe. We want to follow the rules and do what we're required to do, but all the while there's lives that are slipping through the cracks and are we going to be the ones that people are going to hear, I believe in you. Even if no one else does, we're going to choose to, to unashamedly, to unhinderedly, to, to seek out and to invest in people. And when you think about that, the problem is it's a little overwhelming, right? To think about every single person, older or younger, and, and you think, man, I can't, I can't do all of that, so I'm not going to do any of it. And we kind of back away. And, you know, young people, you need to kind of cut us some slack, all right? Because you, you've had access to the world probably as long as you've been around. And, and, and you're naturally now kind of prone to, you, you see a need in, in Africa, and you'll shave your head and do a fundraiser to raise money in Africa. For us older people, and I'll tell you, this is kind of one of the first messages I've ever put myself into the older category. So I'm a little weirded out by then. But that I know a time of life where I didn't have access to the, what was going on in the world, right? All we really knew was maybe what was going on in our neighborhood or what we read in the paper and what was going on in our city. So now to have all of this world events kind of come crashing at us through our phones, it's, it's a little overwhelming. As an adult, you begin to feel just exasperated and like there's no way. I'm, I'm dealing with real life weekly bills and problems and to think about trying to, to be a better human being for the world, is, it's overwhelming. And our awareness has is, is gone through the roof, and it affects us differently. And as followers of Christ, so we're called to do something. And in closing, just real quick, I'm just going to talk about what, what it is. And Paul kind of dresses this tension. He says, you know what, church, what you're called to is to carry each other's burdens. And that's what's happening is we all have some burdens. And he says, you know what, I want you to carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. You will be being like Jesus. But he recognizes this, this can get overwhelming. So a few verses later he says, so let us not become weary. Right? There's that feeling you begin to feel when you see the, uh, the sum of all the problems out there. Oh my goodness, there's no way I can handle this. And Paul says, let's not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if, it all hinges on this, if we do not give up. So if there's one thing to take away this morning, I encourage you to write this down. Here's, here's the theme, to do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. Right? There's no way in the world that you could do everything for everybody. There's no way that you're going to be able to solve all the problems of the world. But instead of saying, man, I can't handle this, I'm going to seclude and retreat back to my living room, you begin to think, man, what could I do for one person that I wish I could do for everybody? And if we all began to say, no, I'm going to do for one what I wish I could do for all, for everyone, then we would begin to, to see change. But what happens? What do we hear growing up, right? Uh, you know, it, what did we used to, to hear as kids from our parents, right? If I let you do it, then I got to let everyone do it, right? Or if I let you have one, then I have to let everyone have one. And now as, an, as a parent, I find myself saying those same exact words. But here's the reality is, no, you don't. 
You don't have to let everyone have one just because you're letting one have one. And I kind of accidentally stumbled into this this week. Uh, this, this recently, my, my uh, second oldest daughter, she loves space and, and she loves Legos. So, so we got her a bunch of Lego sets. But this is one of the Lego sets that we're, we're in this kind of deal we got from this guy on Facebook. And you see, this is a huge Lego set. And we hid a bunch of them because we gave some for her birthday. And we think, man, we're going to make the most of this and use these for like a year of, of special occasions for her because we have a bunch but we were cleaning the basement this week, and she stumbles behind where we were hiding them. And she's like, what is this for, right? Oh, it's for my other child who really likes Legos and space things, right? So, so in that moment, it's just the two of us. I said, you know what? Here you go. You can have it. This is probably some, you know, in the store, close to $200 Lego set we got in this crazy group bargain deal. Right, if my other kids saw that I gave my one child one of these things and not something for them, what's the normal reaction, right? <gasps> you don't love us, right? <laughs> but I, what I want them to know is that, you know what, I can do for one what I wish I could do for all of you, because I do do different things for all of them. And not only can I do that, I want you to be happy for your sister that something is happening. But it was one of the worst decisions of my life because she always needs help building Legos. And I'm working out. In the middle of working out, I get this text message, right? Please come help me. She needs help finding a Lego piece, right? This is literally Augustine. This is, she has an iPod, and she messages me nonstop while I'm working out, right? Please, please, please. And then she's starting to write out, please, and can you come up to my room, right? Help. And this, this was the Lego set that I broke that she has to, I was going to show you. But there's half of the rocket ship that she built. But it's this idea that we can do for one what we wish we could do for everyone. And in my house, I want to create a culture that when something happens to one, it's not why didn't I get it, but it's, man, Augustine, it's so cool that you got one of these. I'm so happy. Can't wait to see you finish. And this was the first Lego set that she did. It was 11 bags, and she did nine of the bags all by herself. And now she has to do the continuation, the rerun of it. Do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. And then do for one what only you can do for everyone. There's certain things that only you can do that's going to benefit everyone else. You being here on a Sunday morning, only you can do that. And when you are here, there's a, a sense of uh, community that it brings us, right? Let's be honest. It feels a lot better when there's people in the seats than when there's not. But only you can put yourself in the seat, but it's a bait and switch. I'm going to be honest with you. We don't want you just to be here on a Sunday morning. We don't believe that life change happens in these rows. We believe that life change happens in circles. So when you're here in these rows, we're going to constantly tell you, hey, you need to get into a life group. You need to get known by a smaller group of people, some people who can invest in you and that you can invest in and do life with. And even being in a life group, it's kind of a bait and switch. Because once you're in a life group, we say, hey, you know what? You need to start serving in the church. You need to start using your skills and you start leading ministries and start pouring into people and say, I believe in you. Follow me as I follow Christ. And that's, that's part of our kind of behind the scenes scheme that we have here. You just got the back behind the scenes view. So I know that we're, we're going late here. Just a, real quick, a couple, couple helpful tools to help you in this. To think about as you're doing for one what only you can do, to go deep rather than wide. Choose someone that you're just going to say, you know what, I'm going to choose to invest in you. I believe in you. I'm going to go deep with you and not just superficial. I'm going to refuse to be superficial and choose one to be deep with. Two, we're going to go long term rather than short term. We're going to realize that this is a, a long-term investment. I'm not going to believe that one, you know, meal that we have together is going to change the course of the world history, but we're going to be in this for the long haul and realize this is long-term, not just short-term. And lastly, to go time and not just money. All right, to go time. Your time is, is the most valuable thing that you have. And when you give it to someone younger than you, when you give it to somebody older than you, when you give it to someone who's in the same life stage as you, what you're saying without saying is you're saying, I believe in you. I believe in you. I, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for, for Mark. Fidelity, if it wasn't for Mark Scorzone, if it wasn't for Pastor Lee, I would not be up on the stage. 
I would not be up on the stage if it wasn't for, for some of you in this room. There's, there's people who may not be here next week or in a month from now if it's not going to be for the investment that you have in their life. Or there may not be people who are going to fill up these empty seats if it's not going to be for the investment that you're going to have in their life outside of here. As we begin to live out this I believe in you culture. I believe you. And more importantly, God believes in you. God believes in you so much. And I have just been blown away, really even this past week, you know, when I think about where we've been over the, the I don't know, four or five years we've been a part of Forward Point here. And there's been some hard times. And just this week, if you can be, if you can realize, if you can imagine this, and, and you probably, I know, wouldn't even think about something like this, but for me, for the first time this week, I heard somebody reference me and talk about me in the third person, was telling the story and said, my pastor... And began to tell the story. We're real intentional here at Ford Point and leadership. And Stephen and myself, we're both ordained. We, we don't carry around titles, right? We don't go introducing ourselves and say, I'm Pastor Jimmy. Or expect to be, you know, kneel before me and kiss my ring, right? That's, that's not who we are. And that's not the culture that we want. But there's something about when I heard these words come out of his mouth and, and being referenced it began to, 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 to give me these kind of Red Bull wings, right, where I believed, man, I can, we can keep taking forward point where it needs to go. There are people who are coming behind and under the vision. We've been trying to lay a groundwork for years, and for the first time, whether he knew he was doing this or not, he said, my pastor, and it filled me with such... There's so many times this week where I just was crying <laughs> because somebody believed in me and, and I don't know I'd still be doing this even if he didn't say that but I tell you what I came away this week feeling that we can go so we, we're going to be able to do so much because we're going to be a body of people who live in this culture of whoever we come in contact with we're going to do for one what we wish we could do for everyone, we're going to go long term, we're going to go deep, and we're going to say, follow me as I follow Christ, and that's going to be our culture. God, we come before you this morning believing, understanding the weight of our investment, that we're all given the same amount of hours in a day. We're all given the same amount of minutes in a day. But it's those who choose to, to spend them investing in others that seem to outlive everyone else. And God, I pray that this morning that you would begin to, to awaken our hearts to the reality of, of what you've done for us for the reality of, of how much you believe in us, the reality of where we are in life today because of you. And God, that through that, we would begin to, to answer this call to invest, to live lives that shout, I believe in you, workplace, boss, coworker. I believe in you, wife or husband or wayward child, teenager, I believe in you. God, we pray that this would be the heartbeat of Forward Point. If you're here this morning, and, and I got to believe that there's, you know, it, it, uh, an opportunity where your relationship with God has, has only been as far as the motions that you go through. And you always felt like that's, that's all it took. And this morning, there's, there's something that God wants to do with his relationship with you, a, a rending of your heavens, where he's able to speak into your life to say, I love you. This is my child in whom I am well pleased. And he wants to take that, that ritualistic, going through motion relationship that you have and turn it into this 
where you can be someone who begins to say to others, follow me as I follow Christ. Through all the nonsense rituals that we tend to do, but in this everyday relationship, in this morning it starts with opening your heart to your own relationship with that God this morning. And if that's you this morning, I just want to give you a chance to make that choice today to say, God, I'm going to choose to turn from all that stuff that I've been doing and into a relationship with you. And it's no fancy words. It's just a a simple change of your heart, confession before him. And I'm going to ask, as we continue on this morning, if you would join me here at Ford Point to be part of this movement. I just want to pray for all of us who would choose to, we're going to start investing and being part of this. I'm just going to ask you just to stand where you're at this morning. We're going to close and I want to pray for all of you just responding to say, I want to be a part of that, Jimmy, What of what God is doing. God, you see every single person offering themselves to, to be used by you. I pray that they first, God, would experience that same kind of amazing encounter where they know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you believe in them, despite the, the past, despite the things that has happened in their life, God, that you believe in them. And God, I pray that you would work through us today, as soon as we leave here in this room, God, that we would just begin to just feel a new sense of purpose here as we begin to believe in each person that we come in contact with. God, continue just to use us as a tool in your hands to be the difference. Not in the way we protest, not in the way we chit-chat on, in common on Facebook, but God, in the way that we live, you would work through us to be the difference here. We love you. Thank you so much. Church, we have people who would love to walk with you through life and pray if there's something that you're going through. Uh, I would encourage it as, as you think through this week. We're going to be diving into this and, and getting deeper over the weeks to come. Uh, make it a priority to, to be here and to bring somebody with you. And, and we're believing God to do awesome things in us and through us. If you're looking to get baptized, we would love to be a part of that story. You can just text the word baptized to the church line there. You can get the information at the info booth. Mothers, we hope to see you back next week. We have something special planned for you and just looking forward to be a blessing to you. We love you all. We'll see you back next week. Get in a life group this week if you're not in a life group.